Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Any opinions or comments made by any guest are their own and they do not necessarily reflect any of the presenters or network's opinions. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway is still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Good day to you. This is Sir Patrick Moore, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal radio network, and this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Hello and welcome to the show, and thank you for that introduction, Sir Patrick Moore. I've got another interesting guest for you today. Mr. Tom Hackney. In actual fact, it should be Thomas N. Hackney, I should be saying, because that's how it's written on his book. His book is Alien Memos, Tidings, Quips and Warnings from Beyond the World. It's an updated edition of the ETI Grail, which obviously was his first printing of the book. But before I get into the show properly like that, I, I want to actually um, address something. As you know, I do get people sending me messages and um, something that came up, just, well, just over the last couple of weeks um, somebody sent me um, something they were quite concerned about it's to do with fraudulent equipment basically I think the best thing I can do is kind of obviously I can't go too far into naming, naming names or anything like that but um, I think I ought to read out what um, what the lady said her name is Claire Signs, and she has given me permission to um, read out some of this Okay, Claire says, Hi, I just wanted to ask you if you've had any bad experience with um, paranormal electronics, as I have. I went through PayPal, thank God. Uh, she ordered a piece of equipment at the end of August and still hadn't had it by December. And apparently she was constantly lied to, too. Um, her husband ended up by going up to wherever it was that she, they got this equipment. Uh, uh, because she put in a bad review on Trustpilot, they said they were cancelling her order. And she said she wanted her order so that she had to remove her review in order to get it. Uh, she says, I was so upset. Anyway, it turned up on the Christmas Eve. It didn't work and the tablet was cracked. She says her husband was fuming, so went up there and put it on their doorstep and demanded a refund. She says uh, she did finally get a refund, but was solely rudely treated and it was horrible, I would never deal with them again. She says, I'm, I'm part of a paranormal group in Wiltshire, and my husband has made myself and son a fully functional SLS. I, I'd sort of message back and say, um, I said, thanks Claire, sorry you had a bad experience, etc. I said, I've not heard of this company before, company I'm not going to name. All I know is you have to be very wary of people selling paranormal equipment. Um, it's not a lot of comeback if um, something's wrong with it or or it doesn't work. Or I mean, I do know of somebody out there who's, who, who sells UFO detectors. Now, I mean, how the hell can you sell a, a UFO detector? You know, nobody even knows what a UFO is or how they work. So it's just crazy. So just be careful. And as everyone knows, in the UK we've had a lockdown period and apparently uh, this person who was selling the equipment, uh, that the police stopped his investigation on a, one night 
Uh, there were six going out on an investigation breaching COVID government guidelines. Uh, they got fined. OK, she says, well done to the police, as we've all had our investigations on hold due to COVID. Why should he do it? She said he even did it live on Facebook, so uh, everyone could see it. So there you go. Um, I can't really comment on that, but... Apparently other people have been uh, complaining about this equipment. So all I can say to anyone out there, when you're buying paranormal equipment, please be careful where you're buying it. And buy it from someone where you, where you know you've got some information and uh, feedback from people that have had the equipment from them that, that they, they consider it works. Um, you know, I, I've had experience where you buy stuff on eBay or whatever and um, it's just no good. You're just wasting your money. So be careful. Of course, uh, once again, if anyone wants to get in touch with me for any reason, um, you can always email me. Uh, my email address is davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. That's davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. Right, OK, right, so let's get into today's guest, Mr Tom Hackney. As I mentioned, his book, Alien Memos, Tidings, Quips and Warnings from Beyond the World, updated edition of the ETI Growl. So we'll just welcome Thomas Hackney. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to Paranormal Dimensions. It's the second show in this new season. Uh, it's show number 101, believe it or not. Last, last one was 100, obviously. <laughs> I've got to tell you, Tom, uh, your name's Tom Hackney. I was actually born in Hackney in London. No, um, not really. I was born in Salzburg, Austria. Right. My, my father was stationed there, and uh, my mother lived in Austria with my father oh, in the right. Army. Yeah. And I just happened to be born in an Army field hospital. All oh, right. Now, so I think you misunderstood me. I was born in Hackney in London. Well, you were, were you? Yeah. In the, so, in hack by name, hack by nature, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's, it's in the London's East End, if, uh, I'm sure all the British people will know that, but Americans might not know. <laughs> but, uh, well, yes, Hackney, Hackney Hospital. Hackney Hospital, yes. <laughs> Hackney Coach, Hackney... Yeah, there's a, there was a, the Hackney Horse Carriage, wasn't there? Right, right. Hackney was, Horse. Which I presume was, uh, born in Hackney, I presume that, anyway. Uh, no, 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 another little interesting thing, you, you live in Savannah now, I understand you've just moved from West yes. Virginia, was it? Yes, it, yes. Yep, yeah, I've been to Savannah, it's a very nice town, very hot when I was there. <laughs> it's a hot town, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it was sweltering actually. <laughs> it, it's, yep. one, it's one of those hot, hot sweaty towns, isn't it? Well, yeah, but not in the winter. No, well, it's probably nice in the winter. Well, you know what the, uh, the temperature is here now today? Uh, no, I've got no idea. 70s. It's in the 70s. Oh, that's, that's just nice, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just one of our nice British summer days, that is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Tom, we're not here to talk about the weather. We're here to talk about you and your books and your... You've got. I think you've had a few articles published as well, haven't you? Um, yes. Let's, let's talk about your book, first of all. It's called Alien Memos, Tidings and Quips and Warnings from Beyond the World. And you like to tell us what that's all about, and uh... well, uh, it's about uh, what I believe to be extraterrestrial communications uh, by semiotic means, which is to say through signals and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, in this case, in, in the cases that I cite in my books, uh, there are three basic um, meteoritic events. Uh, one of them is the most powerful uh, energetic event ever seen by man, and that occurred in 1994, and it, it consisted of 21 comets that uh, impacted Jupiter over six days. Oh, really? And that, that uh, released about 50 million atom bombs worth of energy. On Jupiter. Wow. Now, the curious thing about that is that uh, you know, comets have been thought by all human cultures pretty much to be messages from the gods, you know, uh, mm. warnings of things to come. Uh, usually not very good things, but uh, uh, not necessarily 
catastrophic things, but uh, something big. And uh, 21 comets a few years before the 21st century uh, struck me as kind of odd uh, in that in that uh, context, being that you know comets are messages from the gods, so to speak, or and uh, the, the number of comets happened to be 21. Uh, it's called Shoemaker Levy Nine. They were from uh, a few hundred yards in diameter to about uh, a mile in diameter, and they impacted Jupiter over six days in July 1994, one by one. Of course, scientists were ecstatic about it, but they never um, they never related that to any kind of communication. It was just a you know a, a coincidence as far as they were concerned. Mm. But not me. I was I was actually expecting something like this to happen because a few months earlier, actually, yeah, well, in 1992, uh, NASA commenced a, a SETI project uh, called the High Resolution Microwave Survey, which was about a million times more uh, powerful than any previous SETI project, being that it was funded by the government, the federal government in Washington, and uh, they had $100 million to look for intelligent signals in space, uh, radio waves. And so they um, they commenced it on uh, October 12, 1992, which was kind of odd because that was the 500th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. October 12, 1992 was the quincentennial of uh, Columbus's discovery of America on October 12, 1492. So the search for extraterrestrials, which was, about, as, I, as I mentioned, it was um, you know, the biggest SETI project ever, was commenced on a very curious date, in in as much as Columbus uh, did not uh, really help the uh, indigenous peoples that he, that he encountered in the mm. world. Um, as a consequence, basically, you know, the entire <laughs> the entire hemisphere was. Uh, Infected with all kinds of plagues and, uh, and bloody massacres by the conquistadors, mm. uh, many millions of people died in the, in the New World for various causes. And so, although NASA celebrated that date by commencing their SETI project on that particular quincentennial, um, the extraterrestrials they were looking for uh, might not have have a very good uh, you know, idea of, of what that was all about because here we were looking for newer worlds to discover, right? Mm. So here, here we are looking for new worlds on October 12th, 1992. And what happened to the last new world in 1492? Well, it wasn't a very good thing, obviously, as history shows. Uh, but um, you know, NASA is populated by scientists and engineers and so forth, and as far as they're concerned, history is irrelevant. So, you know, the only thing that's important to science scientists is science. History or linguistics or anything like that is irrelevant. So they were able to slip a, uh, a, re- a, re- a retort in edgewise by... Uh, making something happen in Peekskill, New York, uh, three days prior to the commencement of uh, the High Resolution Microwave Survey City Project. Um, and what that was, a, another meteoritic event, impact event, that uh, was basically impossible. Um, a 4 by 5 by 11 inch meteor impacted a 5 by 22 inch tail light and um, 
obviously pulverize the taillight of the car, but leave, leaving all the chrome surrounding it intact. So it was a very precise impact and uh, in pigskin. Now, the, it was the right taillight that was pulverized, not the left taillight, the right taillight. So visually, when you look at the photographs of that impact, you can see that the right taillight is destroyed and the uh, accent above the taillight, the little chrome slip, slim chrome accent above the taillight, which forms its upper border, was bent over the numbers 933 on the license plate. So 933 just happens to be when Shoemaker Levy 9 was first discovered in March of 1993, those 21 comets. So those 21 comets went on to impact Jupiter a year later, but it was discovered in uh, March of 93, 933. And that was the signal on the license plate, 933, which was, those three numbers were overscored by the accent, chrome accent. And I thought it was all very curious. Of course, the hypothesis that NASA was investigating by uh, commencing the SETI project was simple. Uh, ET exists. It's a simple hypothesis. And that's the basis of their research. Is ET exists, and that's the hypothesis. So the, the extraterrestrials who were watching this all happen responded by saying, right, because it was the right daylight that was polarized, not the left, the right. And of course, uh, the director of the project was the Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. So it was more like, right, Ames, we exist. So it's, it's affirming their hypothesis. But of course, this went way over their heads. You know, they're not interested in phenomenological or semiotic uh, you know, forms of communication. They're only interested in science uh, or what you can re reproduce or project in the laboratory. So, and they're not interested in anything like that. But that was perfectly obvious to me, being just a layman. Uh, and um, so I, I was expecting that something to happen in March of 93, which is what the license plate uh, indicated, 933, March 1993. And when Shoemaker Levy 9 was discovered in March of 93, I knew that was the follow up of the peak skill event. Peak skill, you know, as in, here's a peak in our skill, you know. Hmm. So, peak skill, right, aims, because it was, it was a prodigious display of marksmanship for a, uh, a five inch wide meteor to, to impact a five inch wide taillight precisely, leaving the chrome around it basically intact, except for that sliver of chrome, which was bent over the numbers 933 to emphasize those three numbers. The left side of the uh, license plate read 4GF, 4GF, and that refers to the fact that uh, NASA was looking for uh, spectral type stars of G and F which are the only types of stars that life can exist around. So 4GF seems to suggest that uh, uh, there are four G and, uh, and F type planets or stars that have planets around them that might be very hospitable or, or might refer to their own planets mm -hmm. uh, or different planets. But that's just speculation. But um, and that's basically, in a nutshell, uh, what happened uh, between 1992 and 1994. So I put it all together and realized that this is how they communicate uh, for obvious reasons. They, they communicate this way so basically to uh, 
control for scientists, number one. They don't want governments to be alerted. They don't, you know, they're not going to be uh, worried about science, scientists alerting the government. So it was just, uh, you know, people like us, you and me, with eyes in our head and a brain in our head, who could put it together. So it was able to communicate without causing any sort of, you know, uh, panic. And it's also being plausibly deniable uh, means that, uh, you know, they're able to retain the status quo. You know, they don't want to you know, make things too uh, crazy here by disclosing themselves completely. But then this is how the gods have always operated on Earth, you know, for thousands of years. They, they never substantiate themselves or transubstantiate themselves um, before us. They offer signals, messages, perhaps uh, various kinds, but they will not, you know, suddenly just appear in the flesh uh, uh, in Yankee Stadium or something, you mm-hmm. know, before 50,000 people. They're just not going to do that. They never have and they probably never will. Um, these beings are probably on the order of one to two billion years older than we are, uh, based on the age of the stars um, in the Milky Way galaxy. So, um, well, that's hard to imagine. The, the civilization is billions of years in advance of us, yes. isn't it? It's uh, yes. it's yes. just beyond our comprehension. Yeah, well, this is uh, this is child's play for them, hmm. whereas for us, it's more you know, like magic. But um, that's not surprising, since anything that science doesn't understand is is magic. Hmm. I mean, even to think of a civilization a million years million years in advance of us is uh, is something yeah. hard to imagine. Yes, it is. It is. But a billion years is off the chart. Hmm. Definitely. I mean, the the age of half the stars in the Milky Way galaxy is six point three billion years. Hmm. That's half of the stars. So. Our sun is 4.8 billion years old. Subtract 6.3 from 4.8, you get 1.5 as an average. Hmm. 1.5 billion years older than us. Uh, that's enough to give you, you know, some pause right there. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's making my head spin already. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, my own direction lately... Uh, I've been looking into the origins of life and uh, looking at the research that's been done, and um, it seems that um, you know DNA uh, could not have originated on Earth. Uh, the um, the famous co-discoverer of DNA, uh, Francis Crick, uh, said as much. You know, many times saying that 600 million years or a billion years is not long enough for DNA to develop. And so, um, he went on to, to, to theorize about panspermia to explain life. That is, you know, uh, DNA coming from other planets and the form of asteroids and comets and so forth. Uh, meteors that have you know, little seeds of life in them. But uh, research lately has rather conclusively, somewhat conclusively, uh, stated that, that that's really not possible. It's, it's, it's not likely that uh, life was seeded by, by meteors. So what does that leave? I mean, if, it, if, if it's not, if it didn't happen independently on Earth and it didn't come from other planets, other you know, star systems or something. Hmm. Uh, how did it arise in only 600 million years uh, after the Earth was formed? Uh, life, I mean, the DNA molecule is, 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 is a gigantic molecule, and it's, it's like, it's mathematically programmed, you know, and um, it seems to me that uh, we had help, uh, that this planet had help in, in developing life by probably, you know, either seeding DNA directly or making making it almost 
proto proto DNA, you know, so that it would develop by itself. But um, the idea is that you know the reason why the extraterrestrials do not um, disclose themselves to us or, or you know explain themselves uh, is because they do not want us to uh, know that uh, we are their project. Um, and it's better that uh, we not know this because for whatever reason, but uh, it may depress us. <laughs> I yeah, know. I mean, I would but think they, they would look on us as insect-like, wouldn't they, being that far advanced? Yeah, um, but I mean, it, it, you know, there, there seems to be a purpose in there somewhere. Um, maybe we are, you know, like an experiment of some sort that they're trying to uh, create a life form, a intelligent life form that can survive its own intelligence. Uh, the jury is very much still out on that, uh, on this planet, because you know, we, you know, we have the capability to destroy all life. Mm. And the way uh, things are going politically, I mean, uh, and culturally and morally, it's, it's a big question is whether we will survive much longer without blowing ourselves to hell. So they may have an interest in keeping us you know, alive or at least um, preventing us from self-destruction. And um, perhaps that may explain some of the you know, UFO reconnaissance of you know, various military installations and nuclear installations around the globe. But um, um, I don't think those, the UFOs that people talk about, which um, have no explanation other than probably extraterrestrial in origin, um, probably are not the creators themselves. These are just, you know, kind of like functionaries. They look just the, the, the arms and legs, little, uh, little robots hmm. uh, that, um, you know, pilot some of the UFOs and that have a mission, that have a uh, an agenda to keep an eye on things here and make sure that we don't, uh, you know, destroy their experiment. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel that our That's governments like, know about them? See what? Do you feel that our governments know about them? Uh, yes. Uh, I have let them know. And they have responded. The governments have responded. Well, my government has responded uh, that they, you know, accept what I'm saying and they take it seriously. Uh, they're not going to tell you anybody, anybody about it, but I'm okay with it as long as they know uh, that they exist and that uh, they're uh, looking out for us. But uh, uh, you know, the military or whoever it is that's you know follows me around occasionally when I go to D.C. I used to live about two two hours from D.C. and mm-hmm. I go in every once in a while to D.C. and do some shopping, and, uh, and uh, they weren't too subtle about following me. I mean, they, they wanted me to know they were following me. You know? <laughs> but, um, so, you know, they take me seriously, and they take this whole theory uh, rather seriously, because, you know, Schumacher Lee 9 was, was, you know, 50 million atom bombs. Okay? I mean, that's, that's not small potatoes. Hmm, what does it know? I mean, they can, I mean, that's the biggest thing that's ever happened in, in human experience, uh, in, you know, in real time. So this is obviously something that would interest them. But uh, what are they going to do about it? I mean, they just, at least they know, you know, that they're, that they're there and that uh, they have this capability as far as what, you know the you know the, the the alien agenda is. I mean that's just speculation. 
I give you my speculation, but uh, may not necessarily be the correct one. So after uh, after what you've just said there, uh, when we hear of stories, uh, things like the Roswell crash, and um, how do we put that into context with what you've just said? Well, um, the, um, it's problematic. Uh, um, it, it, it could have been a you know an alien ship that that uh, that uh, crashed. No, I don't think the Inhabitants that were recovered, if they were recovered, are, are necessarily alien. They're probably just, you know, just as I said, just sort of functionaries that they they made. They're probably taking some of our DNA and making, you know, parodies of us and uh, and, and, and letting us see that. But that I mean, that's just. That's just uh, DNA manipulation, probably. Hmm. So, I mean, really, I suppose what it could be, it's just that's another alien race that could have visited here that may not be anywhere near advanced as the ones you're talking about anyway, couldn't they? That's right, that's right. That's what you right, mean, right. yeah. Yes, yes, the ones that we have, or that we've seen, or that have been reported, uh, those are not the, uh, those are not the landlords, as, uh, is Arthur C. Clarke refers to them. Yeah. Hmm. And so you think that our governments will never disclose anything about uh, aliens? Well, the governments uh, have other problems. You know, they have to keep their technology secret from enemies. They have mm. to... Um, I mean, they basically don't tell you anything. They don't have to. That's just the way they operate. Yeah. So every, anything and everything is 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 uh, classified. So they're not going to tell you anything. But this was sort of the, uh, the landlord's way of slipping past, you know, going to the, uh, the side door of uh, uh, human awareness. Uh, and um, you know, SL9 and Peakskill were uh, the result. Um, there was another more recent uh, impact that uh, was also obviously uh, created. And that was in, what was it, two, uh, what was it, 2013. And you, you may re- remember the um, Chelyabinsk uh, asteroid that... Uh, that exploded over Chelyabinsk in Russia. Mm, yeah. That one? Yeah. Well, um, there were actually two asteroids that day. You know, totally different asteroids. One 16 hours after the other. The first one occurred in the morning in Russia and uh, it exploded uh, uh, maybe 17 miles above the Earth and blew out all the windows in the city, destroyed a few buildings, and caused about 2,000 injuries of Russian people, mostly by the flying glass that, you know, just flew into their face and cut them all up. Uh, There were about 1,500 people that applied for medical assistance, probably leaving another 1,500 that did not apply. So figure a couple thousand people were injured, which is unprecedented as far as any meteor events, uh, and also unprecedented in the fact that that there were two asteroids that day, totally different asteroids. The the second one uh, we knew about before. Uh, uh, It was discovered in 2012. That's why it was was called 2012 DA-14. It's coming in February 2012. So we knew exactly when that one was going to uh, appear and uh, come very close to Earth. And um, that, of course, it did. But 16 hours before that asteroid reached its minimum distance to Earth, this other asteroid came down and injured 2,000 Russians. 
but it did not kill anybody. And there were no no uh, deaths from that event. And yet, you know, there were scores of people who ended up in the hospital because of that, but uh, no deaths. So it, it was probably, to my mind, you know, precisely detonated at a, at a, at a, at a altitude that would not probably cause, that would not cause deaths, but would, would uh, send some people to the hospital. And I say this because, um, you know, there were two, two asteroids. One just flew, flew right by the Earth, the other one, which we didn't know about. So it's their way of saying, you know, um, you better improve your you know, your uh, reconnaissance of the solar system because these things can come out of nowhere and, and really mess you up. Uh, obviously, you know, if that same asteroid had been detonated, say, you know, a, thousand, a few thousand feet or a mile or two beneath uh, where it did it, detonate, it, it could have easily killed a million people. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's, it, it, they're sort of, you know, it, it, it's like they're giving us a grade, uh, which is probably about a B, <laughs> you know, as far as uh, protection and um, defense. Yeah, also probably so, less. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they're saying you can do better. You can do better. So that is what they're doing. Uh, they are trying to improve their detection capabilities. So th- there is this sort of back and forth, this kind of communication going on, which uh, not many people know about, but uh, but uh, that's just the way they like it, or the way the government likes it. Uh, I don't care either way, but you know, I obviously like to have more more attention to this. But um, I'm fine fine with whatever. <laughs> hmm. So basically, your book, um, that's, that's the basis of your book, is it? Yes, yes, that's what the book talks about in the first part. The second part is more historical and uh, you know, more of a, a, a critique of uh, human uh, civilization. Oh, right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking a bit of the uh, tidings and quips and warnings. Mm. <laughs> and was the, yeah. They're like jokes, aren't they, quips? Well, let me give you a quip. Yeah. Um, uh, the car that was that was pulverized, that the, the tail light was pulverized. Mm-hmm. The owner of that car just happened to turn 18 on October 12, 1992. So that being uh, the age of majority, uh, that is the that was the 500th anniversary of America which was America's 500th birthday, and it was her 18th birthday. And um, so they were able to find this girl who was 17 when the peace kill event happened, but was going to be 18 in three days when the high-resolution microwave survey was commenced on the 500th anniversary of Columbus' discovery of America. So it's their way of saying, uh, "All grown up, are we?" Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, of course, they're they're telling us that you know we're basically adolescents mm-hmm. as, a, as a civilization, and uh, we have some growing up to do. And uh, but you know, if we're very careful, we can probably get through this uh, very traumatic stage of our you know, puberty, and. Uh, as it is for most people, you know, that age. Um, you know, when things become real, you know, you're not a child anymore, you're an adult. Hmm. Do you, have you any um, concepts of interdimensional beings, or, or is it... Um or, or is it just an extra... Yeah, like an extraterrestrial world that we're, we're talking about here? Well, I mean, other dimensions, I mean... There obviously are, 
Um, the, f the fourth dimension is time, and very few people really take that into account. There are other dimensions probably that, uh, you know, other entities, perhaps spiritual entities, ghosts, uh, all kinds of weird entities exist in probably. This could be a, um, an intersection of universes also, is my, my theory, where our universe is not the only universe. Uh, our universe was created probably by the landlords, uh, 14 and a half billion years ago. And um, our universe was created, you know, with, with hope that, you know, something good would happen. And um, we humans are one of the results. Mm. That's, so these other dimensions, other universes could easily intersect our universe but they do so interdimensionally, intradimensionally. And so we can perceive them, perhaps, but we cannot access them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Because um, it's a different dimension. Yeah. I mean, do we not get some gateways that open up occasionally, by either by design or accident? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, anything's possible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of my. I, I do actually think. Um, I mean, the, the more I thought about things over the years, the, the more I thought that um, we're seeing a lot more interdimensional occurrences with UFOs and and things like ghosts and other paranormal experiences than you know extraterrestrial. Um, and I think there's a big connection between all of that. Yeah, you know, it's just a personal feeling myself, but um, it's it's logical. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a possibility. I mean, what's your feeling on ghosts and things, or have you never investigated anything like that? Uh, it's not my area of interest. Uh, no, just no, the reason I ask, I just wonder if you can see any connections between uh, the, the other types of paranormal occurrences, such as. I mean, when you think about it, if, if what you, uh, uh, <laughs> extraterrestrial beings that are not necessarily paranormal, are they? You know, it's, um, it's just something that we, that, that, that's more advanced than us and we don't know about it. So. Well, they're, they're parascientific. Hmm. They may be normal, but they're not, they're not normal for, for science. Yeah. Yeah, in our normality, that's right. Um, you, you, you have written another book called the ETI Grail. Yeah, Etty Grail. Oh, Etty Grail. Is that, oh, is that what? Is that? What, is that yeah, that's basically. Well, I, I wrote that one first in 2012, well, 12, 2011. But uh, Chelyabinsk had not happened yet, so I had to write the second book to include Chelyabinsk. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Happened in you know in Russia, because that was the, in my mind the third you know, incident. Um. There have been other things, minor things that I have experienced or imagined, which I might include, but I, I don't include them because they're, I don't really have the facts. Uh, I don't have, you know, any, you know, standing to to really, you know, expound about. Yeah. About so you, you like and to actually back back up what you're saying with some sort of evidence, evidential. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the peak scale event yielded a 27.3 pound meteorite, which was put in the museum, American Museum of Natural History. It, it, it was there was a tour all over the world where the the, 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 the meteor meteorite and the car were exhibited together, showing the you know the the precision of the impact. Um, I mean the meteorite weighed 27.3 pounds, which, which I thought was kind of curious. In as much as 933 is basically an expression of 27.3, but that, that that gets a little weird. Um, but it was 27.3 pounds. That's a that's an artifact that that's solid. You can you can take to the bank. Hmm. 
And obviously, uh, the the uh, impacts on Jupiter were you know, the biggest things to happen, you know, energetically speaking, in, in, in human history. So there's documentation for that, plenty of plenty for that. Uh, I mean, uh, there's no question about these events. So mm. I, but I, that's what I focus on, rather than the highly phenomenological and you know, uh, subjective events that I've experienced. I mean, I'll give you an example recently of two events. Uh, as I was moving from West Virginia to Georgia, uh, okay, the first one occurred in the um, was it, uh, September, October uh, of last year, and um, I had a house in the country, and you know, in the middle of nowhere with about two acres of meadow surrounded by ten acres of trees, so mountains all around, and my little uh, earth sheltered house. And it was about, I don't know, about eight, seven, seven o'clock in, in the evening, and uh, there was a wind that came up. It was this really strange wind. It was just out of nowhere. And then there was lightning, dry lightning, no, no clouds, just lightning for for several minutes. I said, "What the hell is that?" You know, that's not supposed to happen. Mm. But then, as I was, after several minutes, I um, I went outside. You know, I said, "What is you know, to look at this phenomenon uh, of this wind and this lightning?" And then, right over my house, there was this fireball, this race right over my house, pretty low. And um, so that that was. That was that was ET's little pat on my back. Um, I haven't told anybody about that. But, then, but right before I left, right the second event, right before I left Georgia, I mean uh, West Virginia, um, the this was in the news. This was worldwide news. Um, the Arecibo. Uh, antenna, you know the one in Puerto Rico? Uh, no, I don't know that one. Okay. Well, there's a, news a, to a, me, dish, that one. a radio astrological dish that, you know, they study radio waves and stuff. Hmm. Uh, it's the largest dish in the world. It's about, uh, thousand, uh, thousand feet in diameter. Right. Which is about three football fields in diameter. Okay. There's this, the antenna is, is, is not the dish itself. The, the, the dish is just the back. The antenna is an extension of the, you know, it, it juts up into space, you know, about, you know, 100 feet or whatever. And that's where the real electronics are, are located. And, 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 the, and this tower, Collapsed. It just fell apart. <laughs> it just disintegrated. So that made the you know, that made the news. Hmm. And the next day, basically, I was gone from West Virginia. <laughs> uh, West Virginia being uh, the site of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, hmm. which is another uh, array of uh, dishes. Which the government uses, which was also used in the high resolution microwave survey, um, which is where SETI was born, actually, at that, uh, that uh, site, known as the NR, NRAO, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, where uh, Francis Drake, or Frank Drake, sorry, Frank Drake came up with his. Uh, 
his his formula for the you know the the, the formula for the, the probability of life in the galaxy and the, the Drake's, Drake's equation. Uh, that's where SETI was born. So um, for the, the nine years that I lived in West Virginia, I tried to crack open that uh, facility, but <laughs> was not able to. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so now here, here I am in, in Savannah, Georgia, and starting a whole new uh, program. Uh, so that's a nice part of the country. The, the U.S. It's, uh, I mean, West Virginia is beautiful anyway. I've been lucky enough to go to both of them. It's um, it's quite a difference, West Virginia to um, Savannah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, West Virginia is high country and mm. Savannah is low country. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got at least you're by the sea there anyway. Yeah, yeah. Have lots of good restaurants. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the gumbo shrimp and stuff like that. <laughs> In fact, I think when I was That's there, there was actually quite a strong. Um, smelly in the air of like shrimp and um, that's what it seemed to be anyway I don't know if there's a factory it, nearby it could be a factory too yeah there's, I'll probably pass <laughs> by one how long ago was that when oh when I was, was when I was in Savannah oh wow um, oh it's probably probably a good 10 years ago now yeah? okay well I think they've shut down the factories so have they it smells a lot Oh, right, so it was a well-known thing, was it? What's, what's that? Was that a well-known thing then, that they they, they sort of put this uh, <laughs> scent in the air? <laughs> oh, you mean the, the, the... Yeah, if you could hear it, like, like I, I, I felt there was like a, a very shrimpy t- smell in the air when I was... Uh, oh, yeah. And I thought maybe it was just that particular area that I was passing by. But Yeah, it could be. But, uh, it's, be- it's still beautiful, it didn't take it away from it, but... Uh, yeah, it, it was noticeable though. It's probably just the time of year that I was there, and it was very, very hot as yeah. well. Yeah, it, it can get very hot in the summer. Yeah. For sure. I mean, have you got a, a background in astronomy, Tom? Is um, or have you studied astronomy a lot? No, no. You haven't. No, not at all. Um, my my field is psychology, as far as academics. Right. Um, you know, so I mean, I'm I'm aware of. For example, of one of the basic tenets of psychology, which is you don't want your subjects to know that you're experimenting on them. <laughs> you want the yeah. results. I mean, you know. Yeah, I think, you I think we know that pretty well for what's going on with a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that has relates to the whole UFO phenomenon. Mm. It's, it's, it's why they keep their, you know, their hands off. They keep. You know, they do not communicate except by semiotic means, as, as we've described. But um, they um, don't want to contaminate the subject by, by, by our knowledge that they're watching us or experimenting on us, or that they that we are their creation. You know, you remember uh, Beyond the Fringe? The mm. comedy group? Yeah. From way back? Yeah. But one of my favorite lines, you know, from Beyond the Fridge was uh, when they talked about the Mindermasts. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Mindermasts. They say, why do they call them the Mindermasts? Why not masterminds? Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they, they don't do that because it depresses the men. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, if you know that you're being, you know, if you, if you know that you're part of a investigation or experiment or whatever, you're not going to behave the same way as if you don't know, right? Mm. Yeah. So to, that knowledge is they're trying to not keep us in the dark about, but inform us very, very gently. Because eventually we will we will come to know, but if it's done gradually, it won't it won't um, depress us too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I get the feeling that uh, the knowledge that we could have is being suppressed by, to us anyway um, by foods we eat and things. And I think there's a there's a real 
well, from what I understand, they're, they're just trying to suppress our knowledge, you know, because of our pineal gland and, uh, you know, and, and feeding us the things that they, we f- that they feed us, the sugars and things, it's supposed to sp- suppress that uh, knowledge. Mm. But, um, I suppose that's a whole other subject, really. But <laughs> so, in, in your so, I mean, do you want to tell us a bit about you yourself, Tom? Tell, tell us what you uh, what your background is. Oh, you, you, that's, uh, psychology is quite interesting to me, anyway. Well, um, I've had a, a rather motley uh, past. I've done Haven't we all? <laughs> I've done public relations. Right. Um, uh, I've done, um, which is sort of how I feel about the extraterrestrials. Mm. Sort of their man. Um, I was the um, I was the vice president of an international public relations company based in New York City. With uh, our clients were basically countries um, and a few scientists. Um, I've done um, well. I've done some weird things. Uh, I've uh, I've worked for North Korea. I worked for China. Uh, basically, doing uh, you know uh, waste. Recycling. Right. North Korea, that's a, I mean, well, you've actually been to North Korea. No, I haven't. Oh, right. I was, I was to say, it would be very difficult to get in there, I would have thought. No, but I, um, I, 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 um, was sort of the, uh, broker for a, um, plastic to, plastic to, um, diesel fuel technology. So you take, Take a waste plastic, like you know, bottles, straws, or whatever. What kinds of waste plastic? Mm. And you can you can melt it down, and you can you can make diesel fuel out of that. Mm. And there's a technology that was developed by an American scientist who took up residence in China, and um, this technology uh, was. One of the things that Korea was looking at, North Korea was looking at to, to, you know, to make some oil. Mm. They, they were really poor. And they don't like to beg for oil from China, so they want to make their own. So the idea was to uh, create a port in North Korea to receive plastic from all over the world in ships and bring it to a um, pro- uh, processing plant at the uh, at the port to pre-process and then bring that product to the factory where it, w- it would be uh, melted, turned into diesel. Now, as far as whatever happened with that, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it would have been very welcome, I wouldn't have thought, by the oil companies. Well, I mean, it was obviously a, a, a big a big idea mm. for North Korea. I mean, they can get they can get oil cheap. They can get all the oil they want. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but I, I I did a lot of business with China, uh, selling uh, our waste, and you know by the shipload basically. Yeah, um, it just sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Selling our waste, but the <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also did steel. You know, copper and aluminum, but mostly plastic is my thing. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. So your books are, are they? Uh, I guess they're available on uh, by, on on things like Amazon and other good uh, book suppliers. Are they? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You can find them. You know, just uh, search for it, the title, and you'll find a hundred different uh, places to buy it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're easy to get a hold of. Uh, have you got oh. have you got a, a website or anything else? Uh, yes, um, I have very limited website. Uh, let's see, it's uh, called SETI Facts. S E T I F A C T S. Okay. Um, probably if you just typed in SETIFacts.com, you might be able to 
Excellent. Yeah, I'll put links to that on the on the Paranormal Dimensions page anyway, Tom. So it's uh, yeah, it's excellent. Yeah, SETI facts. Yep. SETI facts dot com. I'll give you. It's just a one page uh, website. Mm-hmm. But it, there are several links to some of my articles from there. Um, yeah, you've got other articles that you've done, haven't you? There's some magazine articles that have um, gone out, and I'll, you can find them all on there, can you? Uh, not all of them, but uh, if you search my name, Thomas N. Hackney. Thomas N. A yeah. Larger number. But, um, yeah, I've done some books. I've done radio interviews. Uh, I was on uh, Coast to Coast once, and they had their fill of me. Oh, that, 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 small, that, that small show, you mean? <laughs> yeah, the small show. <laughs> Uh, that, that show was like um, two days before the, the great uh, what was it uh, when the world, the world was supposed to come to an end oh right yeah well, that, that's happened several times isn't it but uh, I'm, still, I'm still waiting yeah maybe one and day better luck next time right? but uh, you know it was like uh, this what was it December 19th 2004 something like that mm. in 2013 I think it was 13 I think. yeah it was supposed to be 2012 as well wasn't it it was 2012 right yeah so, so December 21 2012 was supposed to be the Mayan end of the world oh, that's something right. like yeah, that yeah yeah and so that was that was the big uh, you know kind of scan that, that occurred but coast to coast like my thesis for that, so they booked me for that basic date. But then I, I kind of put down UFOs, and they, they cut the, they cut it short. <laughs> and never, yeah. I wonder why. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, yeah, no. it's, uh, we've we've all been through it. <laughs> I'm, I'm persona non grata. Right. As far as old people. Uh, you know, big, big, uh, names are concerned. Yeah. Oh, that's why you're on this show. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, it's been, it's been great having you on, Tom. It's been very interesting and, um, thank you for sparing the time and telling us your story. Um, uh, I'll, I'll certainly put, and also I'll certainly put links on the, on the uh, Paranormal Dimensions page for your books and things and, um, I say, uh, can anyone get in touch with you at all? I mean, would, would you like me to put your email address down or? Sure. Unless you, to give it, unless you want to give it out now as well. My email address? Yeah, in case anyone uh, okay. wants to follow up on this. Okay, T-O-M-K-I-N-S-1 at C-O-R-E dot com. C-O-R-E. Tompkins1 dot com. Okay. Oh, Tompkin. Tompkins1 at core.com. Right. Okay. I oh, will put that on the page anyway, in case anyone's missed that. But, uh. Alright. <laughs> anyway, Tom, it's been fantastic having you on. Thank you for sparing the time once again. And, um, I wish you well in your recent move to Savannah. And as you know, I've just moved to, um, Essex in England as well. So, we've, we've both been moving around about the same time, I think. <laughs> I've just been doing up. Yes, I've just yes. been doing up my little studio today. I've just been painting and everything. So I've just finished over the last couple of days. Been having paint everywhere and God knows what mm. else. And now banging nails in here and there and God knows. <laughs> but so I've just about completed so now it you now. Have nice, you have a nice clean slate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the first show. You're the first official show that I've actually recorded in this room because I've had three weeks off. Uh, the, the previous show was actually recorded. Oh no, I beg your pardon. You're the second one. <laughs> the previous show was, was done a, a week or so ago, but um, oh, yeah, but but then it was, it, was, it was in its old state by, uh, at that time. It's been this is the re, this is the new refurbished one. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to put some pictures up. But, um, anyway, Tom, it's been great again. Thank you very much, and um, hope to speak to you again soon. You know where to get in touch with me. I look forward. Yeah. To it. Cheers, Tom. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, you've been listening to Paranormal Dimensions. I'm Davey Jung. Hope you've enjoyed the show and um, on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Um, Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.
Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the Sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left. Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Thank mm-hmm. you.